Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Linda Williams. I am a Community Outreach and Training Manager with Consumer Action and I am coming to you live from Fontana, California. Today we are presenting a training on COVID-19's impact on food insecurity and we asked the question, do we need to overhaul our community response to the problem? Our guest speakers are Dr. Kathleen Alimo, Ms. Karen Washington, and Dr. Lisa Jans. Now, before we get started today, I have a few housekeeping tips I need to go over. I need to introduce you to CA, and I need to review the agenda. So today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that Consumer Action is hosting in response to the COVID-19 crisis. As the announcer stated, when you join the webinar, you are in listen-only mode. However, if you have any questions during the presentation, and we hope that you have a ton, please type them into the question box on the control panel. My colleague, Nelson Santiago, will facilitate the question and answer segment that will follow the presentation. So he will be busy capturing your questions and he will present them to our guest speaker. Now, if you're on Twitter, you can use that platform to ask your questions. Consumer Action handle is at Consumer Action, or you can use our go-to hashtag, which is CA Webinar. The webinar is being recorded and our PowerPoint slides and handouts will be made available no later than tomorrow afternoon along with a link to the recording. At the end of the webinar, you will receive a survey about the training today. Please complete the survey before signing off the webinar. Those surveys are very important to us. Now, let me introduce you to Consumer Action. What do we do at CA? Well, as it says on the screen, under Welcome to Consumer Action, through education and advocacy, Consumer Action fight for strong rights and policies for all consumers, but especially underrepresented consumers nationwide. How? We advance consumer rights nationwide by referring complaints through our national hotline, by publishing educational materials in multiple languages, through our monthly newsletters, the Insider and Scamgram, and our quarterly publication, CA News, and by advocating for consumers in the media and before lawmakers, and our great outreach department. Since quite a few of you are new to Consumer Action, I thought I would take a couple of minutes to show you how you can download uh, some of my free materials from our website. Let's say you are interested in our COVID-19 education project. Once you're on our website, just click on, look at my cursor, the dark green bar at the bottom. Our web address is at the bottom of the screen. Click on the dark green bar and you will land on our COVID-19 page. Now, when you're on the page, if, uh, if you click on the words resource guide, you'll find valuable resources for consumers uh, impacted by COVID-19 in multiple languages. Now, if you click on the word uh, fact sheets, uh, you will find fact sheets that will include topics such as fair housing rights affected by the pandemic, estate planning, critical decision for uncertain time, and a no number of other topics. We are a 501c3 organization. We're supported by membership, donations, and grants. So at the end of the webinar, there will be information about how you can make a donation to Consumer Action, okay? So let's take a quick look at the agenda. At Consumer Action, we believe in making learning fun. So we open up each and every training by testing your knowledge on the topic of the training with our most popular game, How Much Do You Know? So today we have four true or false questions regarding food and security. Uh, following the game, I will introduce you to our dynamic guest speakers. A question and answer session led by Nelson Santiago will follow. I will come back, I will tell you how you could donate to CA, and then we will wrap up. So let the game begin. Let's launch our first uh, poll question. Come on, Steve Harvey. Okay, so true or false? Food insecurity describes a household's inability to provide enough food for every person to live an active and healthy life. Is that true or is that false? Wait a minute now. Food insecurity describes a household inability to provide enough food for every person to live a healthy, to live an active, healthy life. Is that true or is that false? A couple more seconds. Okay, let's close the poll and look at the results. 92 of you think that's true, and 8% thinks it's false. 
Well, if you said true, you are correct. That is true. Let's launch the next question. According to the USDA, more than 35, wait a minute, 35 million people? According to the USDA, more than 35 people in the United States struggled with hunger in 2019? 35 million in 2019? Is that true or is that false? Okay, don't overthink it. Let's close the poll. What are the results? Okay, so 96% of you think that more than 35 million people in the United States struggled with hunger in 2019, and 4% says it's false. Well, according to a brief published by Feeding America, October 2020, it's true. 35 million people in the United States struggled with hunger in 2019. Okay, let's launch the next question. Many households that experience food insecurity don't qualify for federal food programs and must rely on local food banks. What? Could that be true? Is this true or false? Many households that experience food insecurity don't qualify for federal food programs and must rely on local food banks. Is that true or is that false? Okay, let's close the poll. Let's look, take a look at the results. Wow, 92% of you think that's true? And only 8% thinks it's false? Actually, that one is true. Let's go to the next, let's go, let's launch the last question. Okay, a community garden, a community gardening program can reduce food insecurity, improve dietary intake, and strengthen family relationships? Is that true or is that false? A community gardening program can reduce food insecurity, improve dietary intake, and strengthen family relationship by planting greens. Is that true or is that false? Okay, let's close the poll. So 98% think that is, that is true, 2% thinks it's false. Well, according to a study completed by the National Center for Biotech Information, that's actually true. It can strengthen family relationships. Okay. Thank you for um, participating uh, in the game. I hope you enjoy playing alone. Now to, over to our feature presentation. Break out your pens and your paper because you're gonna wanna take a few notes. Now before, um, I get started, I want to note that March is National Women History Month. And in honor and celebration of National Women's Month, I am honored to introduce to you three women who are making their own history through their great contributions to our society. I am both honored and humbled by their presence here today. Our first speaker is Dr. Catherine Alimo. She is an associate professor in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Michigan State University. Her research and teaching programs are aimed at creating safe, healthy, and a just community and school environments that encourage healthy lifestyles, sustainable food systems, and food security for all. She is currently the co-principal investigator of the Community Activation for Prevention Study, a randomized controlled, uh, controlled trial of community gardening for health. Her research has led her to conduct numerous studies, such as food insufficiency in American school-aged children cognitive academic and psychosocial development, low family income and food insufficiency in relation to overweight in U.S. children, is there a paradox? Amplifying health through community gardens and growing vegetables and values, the benefit of neighborhood-based community gardens for youth development, only to just name a few of those studies. She received a, uh, her doctorate degree in nutritional sciences from Cornell University. Welcome, Dr. Alimo. Our next guest speaker is a farmer and an activist whose mission it is to feed people's body, 
mind, and spirit. She is Ms. Karen Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a little bit more about Ms. Washington. She is a longtime member and former board president of the Northwest Bronx Community Clergy Coalition, which is a member-led grassroots organization that fights for racial and economic justice in the Bronx. As a community gardener and board member of the New York Botanical Gardens, Ms. Washington turned empty lots into community gardens. Just imagine it for a second, empty lots blooming into fruits and vegetables. In 2010, she co-founded Black Urban Growers, an organization that support Black growers, uh, growers in urban and rural, rural setting. In 2012, Ebony Magazine voted her one of their 100 most influential African Americans in the country. She joined a who's who's list that included Barack and Michelle Obama, Oprah, Magic Johnson, Serena Williams, Tyler Perry, Beyonce, and JC. Welcome, Ms. Washington. Dr. Lisa Jans is our next speaker. She is a national program leader and biological specialist in the Division of Nutrition at the USDA, where she leads a funding portfolio in nutrition, including planning and implementing community, community outreach for the amelioration of food insecurity and farm to school programs for K through 12. Prior to her arrival at NIFA, Dr. Jans was a research nutritionist and lead scientist at Ag Research Services, ARS, for 12 years, where she published, check this out, six peer-reviewed publications that has been cited by peers over 2,500 times and have an etched H index of 24, which is outstanding. She melded traditional epidemiology with human feeding trials and laboratory experiments to improve vegetable intake and dietary guideline types and levels in adults. She also conducted research into barriers and facilitators of following DGA for children and adults living in tribal communities across the United States. Prior to uh, ARS, Dr. Jan served as a public health nutrition fa faculty member at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where she taught courses in research and survey methods, community nutrition, public health nutrition, maternal and uh, child health. Uh, Dr. Jans uh, completed a degree in nutrition and dietetics at Texas Christian University, and she obtained her doctorate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a registered dietitian. Welcome, Dr. Jans. Now, before I uh, turn the program over to uh, Dr. Lima, I have a question for her, a burning question. Um, in his book, All You Can Eat, author Joel Berg indicated that hunger is a problem as American as apple pie. And in his book, he takes the test po politicians who constantly ignore the problem of hunger in America, the media who ignores the program only showing lines at food banks during holidays or when there's a disaster or a hurricane or COVID-19, and the food industry which makes fattening, artery clogging, fast foods more accessible for the nation's poor rather than healthy food. So if my question is, if hunger is a problem as American as apple pie, do we need to overhaul our response to that problem, Dr. Palaimo? Let me turn this um, presentation over, over to you. Wait, wait. Where's... If I can find my cursor. Here we go. Sorry, technical difficulties. Let me take that back. Okay, great. Take it away, Dr. Lamo. Thank you so much to Linda and to Nelson and all of you at Consumer Action for the invitation. And thank you for that provocative question, Linda. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you on this important topic. And I hope um, by the end of my presentation, all of our presentations will have answered that question for you. I don't think I have there. Did that do I have? 
Linda, I don't think I have access to. Oh, I do. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. So today I'll give an overview of food insecurity in the US in terms of magnitude, causes, and consequences. We'll talk about how the coronavirus pandemic has affected the situation in the US, and then we'll spend some time talking about solutions. How we frame the problem matters to crafting successful solutions, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on that framing as well. It's always important to start with definitions. People intuitively understand what hunger is, but not always the terms that we use to measure hunger. So the goal is food security, of course, over here in the green, which um, as you learned from the quiz can be described as reliable access to the food needed to live a healthy, active life. But many families struggle to meet this at different levels. We have marginal food security, where families experience anxiety or concern that food will run out, and then food insecurity, either at the household level or at the child level, where we see cutting back on the quality or quantity of food for adults or children. And then very low food security or hunger is where food intake is reduced to the level that adults or children are often experiencing disrupted eating patterns and experiencing that sensation of hunger. From studies with food insecure families, we hear how people experience food insecurity and the consequences for their lives. We can think about food insecurity as having four components. Um, and, and the first is um, lack of stability or uncertainty about the food supply. Even if food is available, it tends to be poor quality or perhaps not nutritious food. And then there are times of food shortage where oftentimes we see parents saving food for children and going hungry themselves, or it can be severe enough that the children are affected as well. And finally, a lack of control. It's very stressful to be without food. As you, know, as you can imagine, or some of you may, may know, and not being in control of your own situation, um, especially if you have children. There are serious consequences to food insecurity as exhibited by the four parts of this circle. So we have poor nutrition and distorted eating patterns as we would expect, but also hunger of the body, the physical pain and discomfort of hunger, as well as hunger of the mind. And this hunger tends to be the most challenging and difficult for people. The trauma, the alienation, shame, the loss of dignity associated with being without food in our rich society. And the health consequences, societal consequences of food insecurity are staggering. In study after study, we see things like poor physical health and premature death, infant mortality, poor work capacity, poor academic achievement, violence, negative coping strategies, and mental illness, including depression, anxiety, and even suicide. And these psychological consequences are due both to the psychological stress of hunger, but also there's a physiological or biological response to food shortage. And we see that actually in dieting studies and actually a very famous starvation study that was during, done during World War II. In the early 1990s, some very dedicated people at the US Department of Agriculture and the US Department of Health and Human Services saw an opportunity to finally have a valid measure of hunger in America. Before that, although it was clear that hunger existed in the US, we didn't have an accurate count. At that time, I worked for the National Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the CDC, and I was part of the working group on food insecurity measurement. So we now have this 18 item uh, questionnaire called the Food Insecurity and Hunger Survey. Um, it's overseen by the US Department of Agriculture and it's been fielded every year in March since 1995. It's part of the current population survey which is conducted by the Census Bureau. So we now have these food insecurity and hunger statistics annually. 
In, 19, uh, in 2019, approximately 12% of households were food insecure, which translated to about 50 million Americans and 12 million children. Approximately 17 million Americans, including 5 million children, were experiencing hunger or very low food security. Important groups at high risk are single parent households with one income source and people with disabilities. About one in three US households with an adult who's unable to work due to a disability is food insecure. And it's important to note that the food insecurity and hunger survey excludes the homeless and people that can't be reached by a phone. So this is pr pretty, pretty likely an underestimate to the extent of the problem. These numbers were already alarmingly high, but the COVID pandemic has seriously exacerbated food insecurity worldwide and in the, in the US. By April last year, household food insecurity had dramatically increased. One estimate was that it had tripled to 38% and was even higher for households with children under 12 years of age. This mostly happened, you know, had to do with the painful unemployment spike that occurred. The US was enjoying a very low unemployment rate until the COVID-19 crisis happened. This chart shows the skyrocketing unemployment in April, 2020. Unemployment has come down since then, but many economists believe that the real unemployment figure is much higher than the official one, closer to 10%. While the CARES Act distributed essential checks and unemployment assistance to people in need, there were also delays, errors, backlogs of claims, um, and, and people ineligible for claims that made it difficult for many people and put many people at risk of food insecurity. It's a tragedy that we have such high unemployment, but now and before the pandemic, however, the vast majority of food insecure families are employed. And if I don't leave you with anything else in this presentation, I hope I can leave you with this, this one fact. So before the pandemic, 78% of food insecure households with children were working. Only 7% of food insecure families with children were not working and not disabled. Why do we see this? The major issues are low wages and underemployment. So in essence, the main cause of food insecurity is not unemployment, but poverty, which Barbara Ehrenreich, who's written extensively on our low wage society, defines as a shortage of money generally caused by a lack of adequate pay. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the already existing income and wealth inequality in the US. Billionaire wealth skyrocketed during the pandemic while regular folks were still struggling. But this was a big issue even before the pandemic. In 2019, the richest 5% of Americans earned 23% of all income, and the richest 20% of Americans earned more than 50% of total income. And we also have racial inequalities that are prominent here um, in the US. You can see on this slide, that the poverty rate before the pandemic was two and a half times higher for black Americans and about two times higher for Hispanic Americans than white Americans. And the percentage is even higher among Native Americans who are not on this figure at 26%. It's not just income inequality, but also wealth inequality. And it's that wealth that can really carry you over in a crisis. So it's, it's, it's just as important as, as income. And this is an older slide, but shows graphically the vast, vast difference in wealth between white, black, and Latino families. In 2019, non-Hispanic whites had a median household wealth of almost $140,000, compared with just $13,000, almost $13,000 for Black householders, and almost $20,000 for Hispanic householders. And I just read an article getting ready for this talk that said that Native American wealth has not even been measured since 2000, but at that time, their median household net worth was just $5,700, so at the lowest level. These differences are due to differences in wages and the lack of inheritance of wealth passed down to family, mem family members. For example, that just looking at the difference between black and white wealth, what does this stem from? 
We had 246 years of slavery followed by racist policies, things like the Jim Crow laws that legalized discrimination, um, things like excluding ag agriculture and service workers from the Fair Labor Standards Act, discriminatory housing lending, we can go on and on. And we can talk about similar brutal stories for other marginalized peoples and peoples of color um, in, in the history of the, of the US. But as we all know, this discrimination still exists today. And a study that was done in Philadelphia wanted to look at the experiences of discrimination and racism and how that is linked to food insecurity. And they found um, that the more people experience discrimination in 10 different settings or situations, such as getting hired or searching for housing, the more likely they were to be food insecure. People of color and people who live in low income neighborhoods and rural communities can face food apartheid as well, limited access to nutritious food because of where they live. The term food apartheid reflects that it's not that food in general is limited, but that the food available is not nourishing or is more expensive. People may need to drive many miles to get to a supermarket from some rural areas or take three buses and or in urban areas. And this is not a, this isn't like a naturally occurring phenomenon, but it's instead due to public policies and economic practices that disproportionately affect people. And just as an example, a recent study in Flint, Michigan, which is roughly 50% African American and 40% white, found that supermarkets are only present in higher income neighborhoods and those with less than 60% residents who are African American. Another result of discriminatory practices by the US government is the dramatic reduction in black farmers. In 1920, there were almost a million black farmers, 17% of US farmers. But in, 19, in 2017, there were only a little more than 35,000 farms with black producers, less than 2%. And this is at least in part due to clear discrimination by the US Department of Agriculture. And it's also due to land theft. Um, I, I was reading in the, in the Washington Post an article about George Floyd, and it turns out that the great-great-grandfather of George Floyd, Hillary Thomas Stewart Sr., was a freed slave in North Carolina who actually acquired 500 acres of, of farmland by the time he was in his 20s. But um, as documented in this Washington Post article, he, quote, lost it all when white farmers seized the land using legally questionable maneuvers that were common in the post-war South. And, you know, the, the, um, the legacy of losing that wealth, you know, compounds itself over, over many, many years. Injustice infects the food system at many other levels, not just farm ownership, for example, in terms of wages and safety. So just a few of the many examples, the minimum wage doesn't apply to farm workers. Um, and then another example, we've seen you know, slaughterhouses be super spreaders of COVID during the pandemic due to insufficient safety and productive equipment provided to workers. Okay, so that's just a really brief overview of what we're facing here um, here in the US. And so let's let's shift now to solutions. When thinking about solutions, how we frame the problem matters a great deal. There's a parable in public health. Some people were fishing on a riverbank when they saw a man struggling in the current. And so they rescued him. And soon they saw a woman and a child struggling, and so they rescued them too. And this continued all day with people coming down the river needing to be rescued. Finally, one of the rescuers decided to investigate. He asked the people coming out of the river, hey, what's what you know, what's going on here? Why are so many people falling in the river? And the people that they, they had rescued told them, well, you know what, there's actually this huge berry patch along the river right up to a cliff. And it's not easy to see the cliff while people are picking berries. And so people are like slipping and falling in. In addition, some people told them that after they were fitting, finished picking, someone came up and stole their berries and pushed them into the river. And some people were so despondent about the situation, they were jumping in the river. And I can go on and on to, you know, like talk about the parallels of this, this um, parable, you know, to our current uh, society. but you know, 
to, to have a, uh, like a happy ending to this parable, parable they, the people asked the rescuers to join them. They were forming a task force um, to put up you know, protective barriers and warning signs, and also to pass laws against stealing other people's berries. And once these things were in place, no more people fell into the river after that. So when we think about this parable, it can help us reframe the problem of hunger from a charity or food-based problem where we see hungry Americans don't have enough food and the solution is food distribution. So hungry Americans are in the river, you know, um, and they don't, have, they don't have enough food and we need to take them out of the river. We need to um, give them food. And instead we can think of it as a basic human rights or justice or, or an anti-poverty based program where we see food insecure Americans don't make enough money at their jobs or society isn't providing an adequate safety net for people who cannot work like children, the elderly or the or disabled. And the solution is to not only provide food, which is the equivalent of rescuing people from the river, which of course you need to do if they're already in the river, but the long-term solution is to provide a societal structure that supports people to not fall in or be shoved or jump in the river in the first place. Although the incredibly incredible comprehensive emergency food system we have in the US is essential for people who find themselves either in a family emergency or a natural or political disaster, um, or, or have you know just recently lost their job, food is not the long-term solution to hunger. Instead, if we're really serious about solving food insecurity in the US during a crisis or even or during regular times, we need to think about addressing and fixing our upstream problems. So there are four components to a long-term solution to food insecurity, either during a crisis like the current pandemic or during usual times, and these components need to work together and I'll go through each of these four components one by one. Before I do that, I wanted to share with you that there's starting to be real consensus that this kind of wide ranging approach is urgently needed. In 2015, led by the Food Research Action Committee, 127 anti-hunger advocacy organizations came together to call for a bold and comprehensive policy agenda to fight hunger. hunger. They agreed that a multi-component strategy is necessary. They said, first, hunger is an economic condition. Policies that promote a full employment economy with adequate wages and incomes can take the country a long way toward ending hunger. Second, preserving the entitlement structure of and strengthening the federal nutrition safety net programs can complement these economic wage and income support policies to end hunger. And finally, the private sector efforts can bolster government's leadership in alleviating hunger, but can take the place of government's steadfast commitment, strong policies, and adequate investments in people. So going one by one, let's start with the Emergency Food Assistance Network. So which this is a, the network is a network of food banks, soup kitchens and shelters that provide food to people in need by serving hot meals or through food distribution programs. And Feeding America is the largest overseeing organization and includes a network of 200 food banks and over 60,000 food pantries and meal programs. The, it's a very large, network and the current extensive nature of our emergency food assistance came about during the 1980s um, when we saw a dismantling of federal anti-poverty programs that were instituted in the 1960s and 70s as a result of the war in poverty and people were seeing you know for the first time seeing people on the streets and um, and and concerned citizens really stepped in to try to help fill the need the COVID pandemic saw demand for charitable food to in increase by 50%. And last year, this amazing network of dedicated and generous people and donors provided 4 billion me meals to people in need. Really, really wonderful. Crises like the pandemic demonstrate that these programs are critical and essential. Charitable organizations play a super important role to quickly provide food for people in need. And they also have a vital role as advocates. But the Emergency Food Assistance Network is a downstream solution to an upstream problem. 
As Radha Muthaya, president and CEO of Washington DC's Capital Area Food Bank put it in a recent political article, there's only so much we can do here. The federal government has an incredibly important role to play. The next component I, I will talk about are these federal food security programs. For over 100 years, the US government has maintained and expanded important entitlement food programs that really do found, form, um, along with the Emergency Food Network, the foundation of the American response to hunger. And entitlement means that all low-income Americans below a certain economic threshold are eligible. It means our taxes ensure that this assistance is there if or when we need it. And the cornerstone program is SNAP, or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It, this is the uh, same program that many people refer to as the food stamp program. Instead of food stamps now, it provides a debit card to families who can use it at the supermarket or farmer's markets to purchase their own choice of food. And SNAP, um, and, and because of this, because it's a card, SNAP utilizes the existing food system that we already have, unlike the charitable system, which creates a whole new system just for poor people. And SNAP is essential. Many people don't know that SNAP provides nine times more meals than charitable food banks. And with a budget of $57 billion in 2020, SNAP served about 43 million people. And it was a 14% increase from the previous year, pre-pandemic year. The average benefit is $129 per month per person. For comparison's sake, this is about $1,500 per year. SNAP is not the only important food security program we have in the US. Here is a list of others. They're all super important. As a result of the pandemic, there have been a few changes in how these programs are imp implemented. And I don't have time to go through each of them, but some highlights are um, the expansion of universal meals for school children, where schools are providing free meals to all children, regardless of family income the pandemic EBT program, which converts the school meal option to an electronic benefit card that families can use at the supermarket, and the very important increase in SNAP benefits. For years, policy experts and researchers have been calling for an increase in SNAP benefits. They average less than $1.40 per meal per person, which means that they often run out before the end of the month, and in fact, they're not um, intended to last for the entire month. Um, and so they don't fully address food insecurity. About half of all households participating in SNAP are, food in, are still food insecure. A 2019 paper summarized research um, on the benefits of increasing SNAP benefits. And uh, this, these increases, like say just 10 to $20 more per person per week can make an en enormous difference. So um, they found things like these increases can Im decrease food insecurity, improve health, improve children's outcomes. This is a, a pretty exciting week for those of us who care about poverty and food insecurity because the COVID relief bill has been passed by the Senate and it looks like it's gonna be taken up by the House to likely be passed today or tomorrow. And one of the important components of that um, relief bill is that it extends this 15% increase in SNAP benefits until September. What we really need is to make this increase in these benefits permanent because you know, we have a very large food insecurity problem um, without, without the COVID pandemic. The third type of anti-hunger programs are social and economic justice programs. These are anti-poverty and health promotion programs that advocate for basic human rights for working families and for people who cannot work. Things like living wages, um, health insurance, safe quality childcare, paid family, sick leave, energy existence, et cetera, et cetera. And we have many of these programs in the US. So for example, um, this slide is showing how many millions of people would be lifted out of poverty 
or are lifted out of poverty because of these programs. So for example, about 5 million people are lifted out of poverty because of the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. You know, housing assistance lifts about two and a half million people out of poverty. Um, you, can, you can see um, other, other important programs on the slide as well. And likewise, the CARES Act also substantially decreased what would have been the poverty rate during the pandemic. So um, really important that we provided that assistance to people. However, um, given the staggering rates of poverty and food insecurity in the US, the social and economic justice programs we have are not nearly enough. And they're far less comprehensive than what is needed. And I really like to showcase what is possible by showing what is happening in other countries that have similar economies to the United States. So this figure shows in red, the poverty rates, the actual poverty rates of countries, as I said, that have similar economies to, to the US. And you can see the US down here at the bottom and it ranks the worst. But what the blue line shows is what the poverty rate would be without the federal programs, taxes, you know, what the tax rate is, and then transfers. And transfers are things like SNAP and the earned income tax credit. And you can see that the blue bars are all over the place that, you know, without these types of programs, these other countries would be poorly off or as poorly off or even worse than um, the US. But that what the but that the US has the least amount of these kinds of programs than these other um, than these other countries. And these are trade-offs that we make as citizens and policymakers. For example, the average American taxpayer pays nine times more for the military than they do for SNAP. These are choices that we're um, making. And so I'm hopeful with the this you know landmark legislation being passed this week that we're making some uh, progress in this in this area. Um, one of another another really important program that's in this legislation that's that's um, that's running through Congress this week is the expansion of the child credit. Um, there are estimates that so so this is a, a a credit that has existed but it's being expanded and then offered to uh, low income families as well as the higher income families that it, that have had had it in the past and there are estimates that this two it's two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars per month um, could lift. 13 million people from poverty this year, including 6 million children, and that if these credits became permanent, child poverty could be cut almost in half. So this is, this is a really, really important um, legislative change. But we, but we really can't stop there. For those of us who care about poverty in the US, the next big policy goal is an increase in the minimum wage. The increase in the minimum wage was a cornerstone policy of the war on poverty in the 1960s and 70s and is one of the policies most responsible for the dramatic decrease in poverty seen during that time. Although many states have higher minimum wages, the current federal minimum wage is $7.25 per hour. Um, but it, the value of the minimum wage um, if we had kept up with productivity should be the, the minimum wage should be $20 an hour if we had kept up with productivity since the 1950s, as you can see on this slide. And research has clearly shown that raising the minimum wage does not increase unemployment, puts money in communities and improves the health and lives of workers and families. I love the quote I read by an economist this week as I was, as I was getting ready for this presentation. He said, when we raise the minimum wage, the sky doesn't fall, you know, that this, this is something that is possible. Um, and a recent study found that raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour by 2023 would would decrease food insecurity. So the minimum wage is directly tied to um, the state of food security in the, in the country. Higher state level minimum wage laws are also associated with other really important things that, you know, like decreasing low birth weight babies and reduced child neglect reports and getting more needed medical care. As I said, society has trade-offs. With the minimum wage so low, most SNAP participants are work in working families, which means their family meals are paid for by taxes and not by the profits that these workers make for the companies that employ them. A recent government accounting office report showed that 9 million wage-earning adults received SNAP, and most of them worked full-time. 
and top employers who have employees uh, that participate in SNAP are things like food stores and food service, uh, fast food restaurants, leisure and hospitality services. And many of these workers are the essential workers. You know, we've really realized who our essential workers are um, because of this pandemic. And, um, you know, with starting wages at $10 and $11 per hour, uh, you could think about SNAP as taxpayers subsidizing these companies' earnings. The average SNAP benefit at $129 per month is approximately equal to a $1 increase in full-time wages. And many employers are getting the message. So we've been hearing news reports, you know, over the past few years, and even even prior to this, that they've that um, th these really admirable companies have raised their starting wages to at or above $15 an hour. But even still, lifting the minimum wage would affect the pay of nearly 40 million workers. All full-time workers with a family size of up to four would no longer be in poverty. So working a full-time job would enable people to make ends meet for their families. And the last thing I'll say about the minimum wage is that it's extremely popular. So an August 2020 survey showed that 72% of Americans support raising the minimum wage. So full-time jobs can pay well enough to keep people above the poverty line. The final piece of the puzzle is food and land justice. And um, I'm just gonna give an overview of the goals of a sustainable and just food system. So I really like this figure from the University of Wisconsin extension that the goal should be a thriving economy, social and economic justice, environmental stewardship, and that's gonna take collaboration and participation to achieve, achieve those goals. An, another really important piece of the pandemic relief that will be passed this week, or hopefully will be passed this week, um, is, a, is um, an important provision that will pay off USDA guaranteed and direct farm loans and associated tax liabilities for farmers, Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, and other farmers of color. So um, re really can um, help to um, move us in, the, in this right direction. Caretaking of the earth is not just for farmer owners. As Linda said, one of my research areas is community gardening and urban agriculture, which can provide self-sufficiency if people have the skills and resources to grow, you know, and, and access to land to grow their own food. Connecting with land and growing your own food has myriad other benefits such as you know, green space and um, beautification, sustainability, improved nutrition and mental health, keeping money in our lo local economies. So just to leave you, you know, a food secure America is an important and worthy goal and also a reach reachable one. Here are just some, of, you know, just a few ideas uh, for people who want to get involved. You know, let other people know about the upstream causes of food insecurity and solutions. Um, promote policies that support income, health, and safety of workers. Advocate for our federal food assistance and nutrition assistance programs and anti-poverty programs. Work towards racial equity. When, when donating, I know uh, many people are, um, are uh, volunteering at food banks and soup kitchens. It's, it's great to talk to people and, and find out what their ideas about what they think would help um, and, and uh, building policies from that, promoting access to land and urban agriculture and uh, community gardening. I, um, I think people are going to get slides, and so I left a list of reading if people are more are interested in uh, more learning. And thank you so much again for having me, and I look forward to answering questions. I look forward to hearing the other speakers and answering questions. Thank you, Dr. Lima, for that great presentation. Now I'm going to turn it over to um, Ms. Washington. Ms. Washington, you have control. Are you still muted? Hi, everybody. My name is Karen Washington. I tell people I grow food. I feed people body and mind. Thank you so much uh, for having me to speak today as a person of color that lives in, that lives in a low-income neighborhood. I have seen the effects of COVID, um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that it, this has been a tough year for so many of us. We've lost loved ones um, because of COVID, and as a result, we realize that we cannot go back, that things have to change. And so I want to begin by telling you a little bit about myself. So 
So, so let me go back. So for me, I started my journey around justice back in 1988, when New York City, believe it or not, had over 15,000 vacant lots, mostly in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. And those that could move, they left, they call it white flight. But those that had to remain, turned these empty lots into community gardens. And so if you look at this picture, it does look beautiful. It wasn't about food at that time, it was about making our neighborhood safe. Now you can imagine that people in community started to make these beautiful community gardens 10 years later, back in 1998, Mayor Giuliani in the middle of the night tried to auction off 100 community gardens. And you felt distrust, you felt blindsided because you felt that you were doing the city a favor of turning these empty lots because at that time there was there, the city was undergoing a fiscal crisis. But they say you can't fight City Hall, but we did. We started marching on City Hall, got other organizations, housing organization, labor organization to fight and we won. And so we were able to save those 100 community gardens. We won the war, but the battle remains as land and urban areas are now becoming up for development. So there has to be a balance between green spaces and urban agriculture and, and development. And so while I was in the garden growing food, I realized that it wasn't just about growing food. In fact, what I realized is that there were so many social issues that were happening in the garden. I heard from people who had type two diabetes, hypertension, uh, people who were suffering from asthma, uh, low unemployment, um, overcrowding schools, um, lack of affordable housing. And I realized that food could not stand alone, that it impacted so, so many people. And I realized that something was wrong with the food system and how it impacted my community. And so I started to challenge the food system and started asking questions. Since 1996, the World Food Summit definition has always been food security is existing with all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain and help a healthy and active lifestyle. And I think we talked about this earlier, but yet there are people pointing fingers in poor, urban and rural communities saying that if you want food security, all you have to do is grow your own vegetables, eat more vegetables, give up soda, exercise and drink water as if by magic, eating vegetables and drinking water are going to solve the problems in the food system without looking at the structural determinants that reinforce racism in today's society. So the question that I ask, is how in the greatest country in the world where we grow enough food and we waste enough food, that food is not getting down to the people that need it the most. And so many of you would agree to that point. And then many of you would say, you know what? You're right. The food system is broken and it needs to be fixed. And you know what? At one time I was believing that. I was drinking the Kool-Aid until I realized that the struggle for good food and clean water brings to the surface the social economic disparities we often see in communities of color and poor folks. And when we don't talk about and act on these disparities, it just reinforces a food system that is controlled mainly by a handful of people with power. Food alone has no power, but has become a commodity and a tool used to have power over others. It is estimated that the population by 2050 will increase to 9 billion people, and most of those people will be in urban areas. Yet can we say that today's industrialization running parallel with the advancement of technology and mass industrial production of food benefits poor and marginalized community? So for years, we've heard the term, this country is the land of milk and honey, but now has it become the land of greed and money? 
This pandemic has exposed the weaknesses of our food system and has allowed a handful of companies to control the food supply of millions of people. So look at our food system. We have gone from diversity to monocropping based on a single commodity crop such as corn. Farm subsidies, which started back in the 1930s was, was supposed to help the farmer has now become a cash cow and dumping ground for processed food entering our food chain with no nutritional value. We've gone from local markets to global markets because of trade agreements. From home cooking to fast food eating. We have number of number of households that don't even know how to cook food and rely on fast food for eating. From seasonality to growing and eating food all year round, like eating cherries and watermelon in December. A food system in low-income neighborhoods that is now charity-based. So can we actually say we're much better off because we have a food system that is less labor-intensive, more efficient and specialized, more mechanized due to technology? What brings us to the American diet. The American diet, which was once largely plant-based, full of fruits and vegetables and grain, is now animal-based with processed food and junk food. As a result, our caloric intake has increased from 2,000 calories per capita to over 3,800 calories per capita. It's cheap with no nutritional value. You know, for years I have criticized this subsidized charity-based food system that has been used as a secondary grocery store instead of an emergency food provider, which it is doing because of COVID. However, this type of food system is not sustainable or should be. This is a wake-up call, a wake-up call for all of us to challenge the food system especially during COVID, when our farming habits have changed, when our farming habits have become more analytical, data-driven, and local. Consumers now want fresh, local, healthy food. They realize in order to fight this deadly disease, we must be healthy and eat healthy. Even technology must do a better, must do, do better in seeing that Everyone along the food chain has access to technology and data. And right now we have thousands and thousands of farmers in rural areas that don't have broadband. We also need to look at the future and make sure that our children are equipped with STEM education. It is science, technology, engineering, and math that's going to lead the way. As for farmers and growers, in light of climate change, we must not think about growing more, but how can we grow more efficiently? We now know who are the essential workers. They are the workers along the food chain. They're the growers, the factory workers, the farm workers, the distributors, the grocers. However, this food system has focused more on profits and less on people and the environment. So I'm gonna ask that question again. As we move beyond COVID, does our food system need to be fixed? I say no. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It's a care system based on race, based on economics, based on geographics. I believe it doesn't need to be fixed, it needs to change. And that change comes with power, power, five letters, powerful words, have to go into the hands of the community. For too long, folks, we have been complacent and silent. We have given up our power to the government, to lobbyists and big business. We must shift this power dynamic food system that leaves the poor and communities of color 
powerless and victimized. So how has the power dynamic of our food system been showing up in our society? Well, it shows up as hunger when we don't have it. It shows up as poverty when we can't afford it. It shows up as diet related diseases when it's killing us. It shows up as organic food when it becomes so elitist and people can't afford it. And it shows up as big ag when we have other people controlling our food system. Understanding the power that we have in community means changing the way we view ourselves holistically and not how outsiders say or think we should be or who we are. Many times in our community, especially in poor communities, we're always looked at in terms of deficits and needs and scarcity and problems. And even I had to change the lens on how I look at my community because I see a community with limited resources as strong and resilient to have capabilities and, and creativity and solutions. And when asked, I tell people, ask our community, not what we need, but what we want. Because if you ask us what we need, it comes from a position of deficit. Ask our community what we want comes from a position of power. We must value our social capital and communal wealth. So what does that mean, value our social capital? It means that every person in this country has value. Collectively, we have the power to change, but many times we are pitted against one another based on bias or external factors. Even before the pandemic, People were calling where I live, my community, food deserts. Now folks, I don't live in a food desert. I don't like that term. And I've heard terms being used besides food desert, food swamps. And recently I heard food mirage. Folks, are you kidding me? It's an outside term, a political construct, jargon that has been used to believe that we don't have food or we don't have supermarkets. But in fact, we do have food. We have the fast food. We have the junk food. We have the processed food. What we don't have are healthy food options. So I coined the term food apartheid. And people say, whoa, wait a second, food apartheid? Yes. And I coined that term because I want us to have these hard conversations about the effects of systemic racism, income inequality, and demographics. Right now, our food system is based on the color of one's skin, how much money they have, and where they live. And until we recognize that healthy food is a human right for all, we must continue to have these hard conversations. Another term that you widely use is food justice. And I say it doesn't exist. And I say that because so many people have co-opted that term to pad their mission statement, their visions, it's in their grants, it's in their RFP. And I say that because if you look at that, defin that definition, a transformation of the current food system, including but not limited to eliminating disparities and inequities, the word transformation is critical because food justice is not a passive movement, it's an active movement. And so if you are working towards food justice, you must then be actively working on the social injustices that you see. And some of the social injustices are here, persistent race, gender, and class inequalities. The lack of opportunity to be self-sufficient and self-reliant, what does that mean? That means the ability to make decisions, to have a seat at the table. Again, we talked about land loss because of racism and policies, but we also need to talk about land displacement because of gentrification. Again, the injustices around wages and also the lack of understanding the historical content of trauma. For people who have been oppressed over 400 years, the trauma still exists. 
And until we talk about trauma and the truth on how this country was built, we continue to have those hard conversations. And of course, we need to talk about power. For many of us, our food system and economic system has been extractive. We have seen our resources, our money constantly moving out of our community. We shop outside our community. We travel outside our community. We bank outside our community. So when, we, when, when it comes to talking about correcting this situation, it's through base building and communal wealth. So what does that mean? And what does that look like? It looks like the principles of food sovereignty. Again, food sovereignty is the rights of people and governments to choose the way food is produced and consumed in order to respect our livelihood, as well as the policy that support this choice. This term has all also been co-opted. This term was, was brought to the forefront by organizations like La Via Campesina, peasants from the global south, who for so long have been fighting for the rights of governance. The goal when we talk about food sovereignty is less dependence on capital intensive inputs that extract and greater attention to the social and environmental principles that build communal wealth. In principle, it's about equity in the decision-making process and the distribution of resources when it comes to the common good of all people. Power, power, mu power must be placed back into the hands of people. With that power, you can advocate for greater control over food production and consumption by people who for so long have been marginalized by those with power over them. But power, it's a drug, you gotta have it. But as long as we have a food system that embraces a power dynamic society of power over others, it will remain stagnant and resistant to change. So from small farmers and growers to food and farm workers, a healthy food system is not just about growing food, but making sure all parties along the food chain are treated fairly and humanely. Food has become a commodity based on profits and not on people. So in order to change the food system, we must face the fact it's about giving up or sharing power. A food system that is dominated by white privilege and wealth with a historical frame of power over others have to acknowledge that power and give it up. So what must we do to change the food system? Again, we must recognize the true power lies in, within our communities. More than ever, this pandemic has forced us to redefine what community looks like. We now have engaged folks to focus on a local economy food system that supports local businesses, small farmers, farm workers, locally grown food and farm workers' rights. We now have all walks of people standing on food lines, businesses, mom and pop businesses going out of business, everybody feeling the effects of COVID. Yet, there are people not standing by idly. There are people, especially in underserved communities that are doing things because they're not getting the support of the local government. Things that they're doing, they're reclaiming land, developing community gardens and urban farms. Folks, my phone, and email has been off the hook of people wanting to all of a sudden turn their front yards and their backyards into growing spaces. People in, in, in housing want, want to grow food on, their, on, their, on a windowsill, on their terraces. 
We're talking about land reparations for the first time. And I know a lot of you are scary about what does that mean? But it's a conversation that we need to have to make sure that we understand how land was gotten on the backs of enslaved and indigenous people. They're growing food more that's more culturally appropriate because they can't find food like that in their local grocery stores. They're developing educational curriculums that talks about the history around agriculture that is truth-based and inclusive. They're saving seeds now in defiance of a handful of companies that feel it's their God-given right to patent them. They're growing herbs for healing and medicine. They're also forming coalitions and investment funds. They're marching in the streets demanding change. They're taking back the narrative, our own history, and making sure that there are contributions of people of color when we talk about agriculture. Speaking up and demonstrating against injustice, forming farmers markets and food boxes and food co-ops, and having virtual conferences and webinars on skill sharing and communal investment, forming local economy and co-ops. So your homework assignment, together we must change the food system by, by speaking up and advocating for supporting the rights of farm workers and restaurant workers and grocery workers and not be silent and complacent. Supporting those working on access to land and affordable housing. Be open to the ideas of what reparation will look like, especially for people who had their land stolen. Demand food that is healthy and clean water. Both are human rights. Support the right to save seeds and have food labeled. Speak up against hazardous working conditions that we've seen in major food facilities and businesses. Make sure your elected officials are accountable. Break bread or have a meal with someone you don't know. Make yourself feel uncomfortable to be comfortable to have these hard conversations. Speak up, speak out when you see injustice and strive for communities that cherish diversity and inclusion as assets. And of course, develop and support youth leadership. They're our future generation. One last point. Last month, I was asked a question. How can agriculture continue to focus on healing? And when thinking about this question, I immediately turn towards life after COVID, COVID. And I said, to be honest, we can't even focus on healing if we have not acknowledged the trauma that has happened to people, animals, and an environment. We have never fully addressed the evils of slavery or the eradication of indigenous people. We have kept that part of our history either hidden or intentionally erased as not to face the sins of this country. The fact that we have developed an economic system based on capitalism that has been extractive and exploitative focus more on profits than people. We have shied away from having a truthful conversation on how wealth was built in this country. Who has access to land? Who has access to capital and resources? We have allowed di di diverse rhetoric to become the main narrative of this country due to silence and complacency. So to answer that question, we have to go back to the true embodiment of agriculture 
which is culture. Culture embodies diversity. It embraces our differences. A monolithic approach to growing food does not work from the standpoint of what we grow or who is growing our food. Our food landscape has changed. There are people with power and privilege controlling most of the industrialized food system, namely white men. And yet the vast number of people growing our food globally are women and people of color. Today, food has been an essential part of our lives. We see how important it is in combating this enemy we call COVID. COVID has shown us it's an equal opportunity virus as we continue to lose thousands and thousands of lives. Folks, this is our defining moment, our defining moment as a nation to examine the food system. As we know, folks are waiting for the vaccine, being healthy and eating healthy are essential tools in fighting this virus. So in the name of food justice, agriculture must be fair and just. Healthy food must be a human right for all along with water. We must see the, the opportunity to have land and grow food as an option for all and not for some. We must acknowledge the practice of indigenous people and not co-opt their ideas or practices as new discovery. When we talk about what means to be inclusive, that means having power in the decision-making process in all aspects of agriculture, from policy, regulation, laws, and a seat at the table. Because without the decision-making process, a seat at the table is nothing more than tokenism and window dressing. COVID, along with January 6th insurrection, has shown us that we have a lot of healing and repair to do. So as we look forward to healing, again, it must begin at the local level within community. We must start the caring and sharing amongst us. It's not the government, but the people who will make a difference. Finally, we must raise our voices and shovels together. The impact from COVID has magnified the inequities around hunger and poverty of which most of us know too well. This is our time. We cannot go back. We must reach across communities and states and nations. We now have engaged consumers to focus on a food system that supports farm workers and small farms and locally grown food. Our food system on one hand is complex, other hand, simple. There are dots along the way that we must connect from the person that puts that seed in the ground to the food that's on your plate. Together, this food system is ours to take back. We all must play a role in building a healthy food system that is fair, just, and equitable for all. And it starts with each and every one of us. So in closing, to grow your food gives you power. You know who, why you grew it. You grew it for yourself, your family, and your community. Thank you so much. My name is Karen Washington. I grow food. I feed people body and mind. Thank you, Ms. Washington. And now let me turn, thank you so much for your presentation. Let me turn the presentation over to Dr. Lisa Jans. Okay, Dr. Jans, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Washington. Um, I'm not even going to try to uh, follow up these two strong women. Uh, what I'm gonna do though is take kind of a right turn and I'm going to tell you about some funding opportunities to fund programs that have been discussed today. Um, I'm with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and today's agenda, I'm going to give you a brief overview of NIFA. I'm going to talk about a couple of grants that may be of interest to you, and then I'm going to talk about how to apply for a NIFA grant. So first, a civics lesson. 
Um, here's the U.S. government uh, organizational chart with the judicial, legislative, and executive branches shown. And in green, you see the Secretary of Agriculture, which is the Department of Agriculture, um, as part of the executive branch. USDA strategic goals uh, has several strategic goals. One of them is to provide all Americans access to a safe, nutritious, and secure food supply. So we're really happy to be at the table here. The USDA's organizational chart is here. Um, over, we have food, nutrition, and consumer services, which is where you'll find the SNAP program and the school lunch program. NIFA is under research, education, and economics. And who are we? We are the lead federal agency providing extramural funding for food and agricultural sciences. We were structured through the Food Conservation and Energy Act of 2008. Our budget is approximately $2 billion this year. Mission is agricultural research, education, and extension. And we want to catalyze transformative discoveries, education, and engagement to address agricultural challenges. Uh, NIFA programs cover many topics. I'm going to focus right now on nutrition and wellness. I'm a national program leader. Um, Mallory and I are both new NPLs, and I'll talk a little bit about what we do. We are the people you would reach out to if you're interested in applying for a NIFA grant. So what does an NPL do? My role is to provide excellent customer service. If you have uh, questions about the applications I'm going to talk about, you contact me, um, either by phone or by email. All of our grants are reviewed by a panel of approximately 20 peer reviewers. So when your grant is reviewed, it's going to be by other people who are in the same business as you are. I manage the panel process and make funding recommendations based upon the panel decisions. And then after you get your award, if you need to change the scope of your project, if you need to extend it or whatever, you contact me as well. So here's some of our competitive nutrition programs. I'm gonna focus on the bottom three community food projects, which um, has about $5 million in anticipated funding this year. It's got about a 15% success rate, so keep that in mind. Uh, the Food and Agriculture Service Learning Program, which has just had its funding doubled to almost $2 million, it's got an 8 to 9% funding rate, but I'm anticipating that to double uh, based upon the um, increase in funding. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, which is a huge program um, and has a much higher success rate. All right, so the first granting opportunity I'm going to talk about is the Community Food Projects Grant. So this project includes community food projects and planning grants, two separate ones. This is a program to fight food insecurity through developing community food projects that help promote self-sufficiency of low-income communities. And both of these are designed to increase food security by bringing the whole food system together to assess strengths of the community, establish linkages, and create sustainable systems that improve the self-reliance of community members over their food needs. The purpose of the CFP is to support the development of projects with a one-time infusion of federal dollars to make the project self-sustaining. And the purpose of a planning project is to complete a plan toward the improvement of community food security in keeping with the primary goals of the program. So these are focused on a defined community and describe in detail the activities and outcomes of the planning project. All of these projects need to be developed with community input. Community needs to have a seat at the table, not just us coming down and saying, here's what we're gonna do for you. And uh, often communities have a much different idea of what they need than uh, what the um, 
interveners would like to um, bring in. So applicants are encouraged to seek and create partnerships with public or private, nonprofit or for private entities, including links with academic institutions and or other um, appropriate professionals. And only the applicant must meet the eligibility requirements, which I'll go over in a moment. So for the Community Food Projects Program, a one-to-one -one match is required. So for every federal dollar that you request from us, you need to have a dollar um, matching. However, this may be in kind. If you have land, the value of the land that you're using to grow food can be included in that one-to-one -one matching. People's salaries can be included in that one-on-one -on -one matching. The grants themselves, the CFP is a $400,000 up to 48 months, and the planning grants are up to $35,000 for up to 36 months. And here is a link to the um, request for applications. Right now, it's due on May 3rd. So some examples of projects include, but aren't limited to, community gardens with market stands, food hubs, farmers markets, farm to institutions projects, and marketing and consumer cooperatives. So we see projects such as um, increasing uh, farmers market capacity or putting out um, restaurants that are community run. Examples of planning projects include but are not limited to community food assessments. All projects must involve low income participants. And here's the programmatic contacts for the community food program. Myself and Brianna Burke, who is the team lead for this program. Okay, the Food and Agriculture Service Learning Program. The goal is to increase the knowledge of agricultural science and improve the nutritional health of children by increasing the capacity for food, garden, and nutrition education within host organizations or entities such as school cafeterias and classrooms while fostering higher levels of community engagement between farms and school systems by bringing together stakeholders from multiple parts of the food system. This program is intended for applicants to scale up or further develop existing farm to school initiatives. And applicants should also add to existing um, activities to include training, technical assistance, and uh, leadership building in children. There is no matching requirement. Uh, FASLIP grants are up to $225,000. All projects must involve underserved rural or urban communities and facilitate a connection between elementary and secondary schools with agricultural producers in the local and regional area. And here's a link to that grant. Uh, some examples include, you can read here, encouraging increased consumption of fruits and vegetables through promotional activities, uh, developing and evaluating integrated curriculum, uh, providing technical support in the form of face-to-face -face trainings, consultations, webinars. Obviously, a lot of our uh, programs have had to pivot and go to online webinars instead of face-to-face. -face. And I'm the programmatic contact for this program as well. And I'm going to talk just briefly about the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program. This is not one in my portfolio, but I want you to be um, to know about it. The Gus NIP program funds and evaluates projects intended to improve the health and nutrition status of participating households. And there are three different goals. One is an incentive grant. These are all uh, targeted towards supplemental nutrition assistance program uh, participants. So these provide incentives at the point of purchase. The pres produce prescription grants provide financial or non-financial incentives to members to purchase or procure fruits or vegetables. And then there's also a uh, training and technical assistance core, which is not available at this time. And contact Dr. Mallory Canings uh, for Gus Nip questions. And here's a link to the RFA list. We have a lot of other uh, granting opportunities, ones for 
uh, training teachers, for training students, um, education and workforce development, a lot of different types of grants. Now, I've listed here how to apply for grants, but since you're going to get a copy of these slides, I'm going to just kind of jump over them and let you uh, read it for yourself and reach out to me if you have questions. So this is the request for application, and it's got a ton of information in it. Eligibility for the CFP programs must be public food program service providers, tribal organizations, or nonprofit entities, including gleaners. Eligibility for FASLIP is pretty much wide open. Um, anybody can apply for this. So how to get started? Read the RFA. Um, these are legal documents, and when I visit with you on the phone or through email, I'll have it open in front of me because that's um, I can't really interpret things as well. I can read what is in the RFA. So if you still have questions after reading it, call or email us, and we can assist with programmatic questions or direct you to uh, contacts if you have questions about the budget. And it's most helpful if you can put questions in writing first so we can best assist you. And please be patient. We get about 50 emails a day about these, um, but we will get back to you as soon as possible. Here's a great webinar to watch on community food projects and how to apply. And there are more national program leaders and here's a link to their information. Okay, now I'm going to jump over. This is an, uh, a way, an example of how you can find previously funded projects to see if yours fits within the parameters. And so if you follow the arrows, it will show you how to access a summary, which will tell you the approach, the objectives, um, the funding, the year that it was published, um, of, and uh, progress reports of different organizations. Okay, if you want more information and a really dense read, the NIFA explanatory notes, and here's a link, lists all the NIFA programs, brief summaries and authorizations, lists current budget and proposed budget changes to next year's budgets. Don't be alarmed, they're often zeroed out, but then we um, end up getting funded and it prioritizes new areas for work to justify proposed budget changes. Food security is front and center uh, this year. All right, and I will leave you to ask questions. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jans Nelson. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have some questions. We have a lot of... Uh cheers for for our speakers people are telling us how wonderful the speakers have been and everybody is dying to get copies of this presentation so thank you to the presenters um one question uh, you know if somebody what are what kinds of resources are available if somebody uh wants to transform their community wants uh, to see more more of the things that for example miss washington was talking about and dr alimo what where do you go is there a one-stop shop to get started That is an excellent question, Karen. Do you wanna um, do you wanna start? Well, I know, and I'm, I'm I'm from New York City, so we have um, programs, two programs. We have Green Thumb, which is city based. They supply uh, resources and materials, and they have webinars. Then we have the New York City Community Garden Coalition, which is an advocacy group working on the protection of community gardens, and then each borough. Like say, for instance, I'm in the Bronx, so New York Botanical Garden has a Bronx Greener program that assists um, people in the Bronx if they want to start gardens and also giving them supplies. I know there's one in Brooklyn and one in, in Queens. And usually it's the committee. If you, if you find an empty lot, find out exactly who owns it. If it's privately owned, talk to the owner. If it's um, owned by the city, Ask the city and at least have at least have at least 10 people working making that a community garden. I hope that helps. Yeah, um, I, I'd also recommend 
finding out um, if there is, you know, if there is a community gardening organization in your area, like Karen said, she's from New York City and I'm um, from Michigan, we have, you know, different organizations here. So searching to find organizations in your area. Many, um, many cities and states have food policy councils now that are really um, looking at their food system comprehensively to try to make these transformations. So working or starting a food policy council in your area. Um, we have state extension services as well that, that can help with um, agriculture information or, um, you know, in Michigan, we have many resources that are available for people who are working in food policy councils or in food policy in, in their in their area. If if somebody has a specific question about their area, I'd be happy to help them problem solve so they can just send me an email um, and I'd be I'd be happy to um, to answer more questions about this specifically that way. Yeah, that's great, especially if somebody can't find the local extension office or something that'd be great and everybody will you will have everyone's contact information since we are sending out the the information tomorrow and and uh dr alamo you talked about how you know some of the extensions we've seen in in the snap program for example um and how you'd love to see these extensions re become permanent um what um what has to happen to to for those to be permanent or even more expanded even more yeah, these are these are changes that Congress enacts. Um, so, for example, you know what's going through the legislature right now extends that 15% increase in SNAP benefits until September, but Congress can then you know pass another bill that can um, increase those those benefits for a longer term period. Um, they can change the eligibility requirements so that more families are eligible for SNAP. So really, um, the, the challenge for pe you know, people who care about these kinds of policies is to get them through Congress. And so this is why you know, being active citizens and vocal citizens really matters. So calling your representatives um, and, and, and showing up at their offices or even taking a trip to Washington and advocating for these kinds of policies, working with organizations that are advocating for these kinds of policies are really, really important. And then getting involved in, um, in elections because it dep you know, depending on who is elected is, you know, is, is deciding whether, you know, whether or not your congressperson is going to be supportive of these. And so um, get, getting involved at the local level um, in, in elections as, as well can really, you know, you know, people can really participate in making these policies happen in that way. Thank you. And, and then Dr. Jans, is, is there, if people want to find out of, say, the, the funded projects, projects that have been funded, that have been the most successful, is there some kind of research either on your site or maybe another organization that is tracking some of the, the, the best projects that have been funded by USDA uh, in terms of the projects you were talking about? Um, uh, you know, not really. We don't quantify things as being good projects or not. I think all of them in their communities are doing great work. Um, people finish their grants, they do the work that they needed to do. And um, so I would suggest looking through um, the, uh, the slides that I gave you for how to seek out um, projects. I hope that helps or you can of course contact me. Great, so people can talk to you about their, their, their the projects they're thinking about. Absolutely, that's what that's I'm here for. Okay, and then uh, we have one more question. How can community change trade policies and the current food economies that, that are affecting food security presently? How to change trade policies and the current food economies? I think maybe Ms. Washington was talking about some of that, uh, maybe Dr. Limo. Again, you have to really, the people who have the power, a lot of trade, you know, comes with, is done by politicians, but it's politics. 
And so again, working within your communities to really make sure that the politicians are accountable so that you can make change. And make change is not one person, it's a group of people coming together and demanding change. That's that's one thing. Um, even within our community, because we didn't have we did not have or receive any resources, we developed a fund, a fund to help our farmers and um, um, businesses in need because we weren't getting any finance from the government or local officials. And as a result, we were able to get a lot of money. And that's because of social capital and community wealth, getting people to understand, especially in low-income neighborhoods, starting to have those hard conversations about what financial education looks like to get us off these food pantries and soup lines and looking at developing a new economy within marginalized communities that that so they become self self-sufficient and self-reliant. I want to see my community with budding businesses that are owned by their faces instead of having people totally on food pantries and soup kitchen lines. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Linda, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you since we are running over time uh, at this time. If folks can continue to send send in their questions and we can try to get them to our speakers. Great. Thank you, Nelson, and thank you uh, to our speakers. I just wanted to tell you about some upcoming uh, trainings. Um, we have the, uh, I've noticed that quite a few of you are not registered for the rise of fraud and identity theft in the COVID-19 era. If you need an invite to that training, please let me know. You have my contact information and I will send you an invite. That training is coming up on March the 23rd. On April the 20th, the adoption of contactless payments in the COVID-19 era uh, uh, pandemic is going to be held on April 20th. And on May 11th, the impact of COVID-19 on retirement savings. Uh, so watch your inbox in for those um, invites uh, coming up. Uh, again, the webinar was presented as part of uh, Consumer Action COVID-19 uh, um, project, and you can find all materials related to our COVID-19 project at that uh, web address. Uh, and if you are interested and would like to contribute to Consumer Action, you can do so online by credit card or by using PayPal. You can even mail a check to us, and that's the address um, below. Uh, again, I want to thank our three dynamic speakers for their time and their commitment. As Milo Angelou once said, a hero is any person really intent on making a better place for all people. And I want to thank Dr. Alamo, Ms. Karen Washington, and Dr. Lisa Johns, because I feel you are heroes in my book because you are doing just that through your work, making a better place for all people. I would also like to thank you for joining us today and for doing the work that you do each and every day. You are heroes too. I look forward to welcome you back on March the 23rd for the rise of fraud and identity theft. So make sure you contact me, hit me up so I can give you an invite so you can register for that training. In the meantime, until then, be safe and stay sane. And thank you for your service. Bye now. Thank you for joining us today.